So this happened about 13 years ago. I was 10 years old at the time and my brother was 8. During that year, we had just moved to a new town and the Walmart had this sweet arcade up near the service desk. So every time my parents would bring us grocery shopping, they'd give us a few dollars and let us go play in the arcade. Now, the town had an incredibly low crime rate and the arcade was right at the front of the store where dozens of people were checking out. So I mean, what could possibly go wrong? So, my brother's playing the claw machine while I'm standing on the side of it and trying to help him angle it perfectly above a stuffed animal that he's trying to get. Suddenly, this random hillbilly walks up to the claw machine next to us, inserts a quarter, and begins moving the claw around. But for most of this time, he's making eye contact with my brother and smiling, not even watching his own game. He's not even talking to us. He's just staring and smiling. He has long, thin brown and silver hair pulled back in a loose ponytail at the base of his skull. He also has a camo trucker hat and a long, scraggly beard. I think I can remember vividly the way he smelled. It was kind of like a stale beer ashtray and something that smelled like a sweet yet sour dirt. Or maybe fungus. I'm not really sure. He tries to make small talk with me and my brother. The way we were raised was to always be aware of strangers, but still be polite. Eventually, we get bored of the game we're playing, and I usher my brother to follow me to a new game, which was on the opposite side of the arcade. A few seconds later, the man follows us, then stationing himself once again right at the claw machine next to us. At some point, an overweight lady had walked in and then said to the hillbilly, Hey, what are you doing to these little kids? And then snickers at me. He then replies with, I'm trying to win them some stuffed animals. The lady then begins playing the call right on the other side of us, so pretty much now my brother and I are literally sandwiched right between these two strange hillbillies. His comment comes across kind of weird to me because I previously thought that maybe he was just trying to win something for his kids or something, but this entire time he had just been following my brother and I around from game to game trying to win us toys. This has been going on for maybe about 20 minutes at this point. They followed us to several different machines and spent a lot of money. Every single time my brother and I switched machines, they'd follow us. The hillbilly then says to the lady, Hey, I'm out of money. You got any? She then says back, Nah, I'm broke too. My brother then says, I have a dollar still. Now, this is the part that really scared me. I remember listening to these two talk about some really weird things to us. Asking if I have a boyfriend, asking where we go to school, where our parents work, if we've ever done drugs, etc. But when my brother said he had a dollar, she then responded with the most terrifying thing I'd heard from them yet. The woman suddenly burst out with, Well shit, then go ahead and give it to him, boy! Her face was red. The tone in which she shouted was so ear-piercing and gut-wrenching that I could feel the blood drain from my face. My brother looked like he was about to cry. He hands her the dollar, and her face lights up. She laughs it off, almost like she's trying to make it seem like she was joking when she yelled at us. My father then walks up a couple of minutes later. As I turn to tell him that these people have spent about $15 to win toys for us, they leave hurriedly before he's able to get a good look at them. My dad is totally livid. He takes us up to the front desk and he tells them what I told him. They had made an announcement on the intercom to keep an eye out for these people and to report it to an employee if they see them. Then they call the police. I don't actually remember this part or really much of anything after my father arrived, but this is what he told me. They never did find the couple. Apparently, the police reviewed the security cameras and then told my parents that the couple left the store pretty much immediately right after my father showed up, and without any groceries. Every time I see a man or woman in Walmart that looks as I remember them, I get really bad anxiety and try to avoid them. This was in late spring 2017 in Washington State. I had made a new friend named Jen and we had started to hang out a little more frequently. I was 20 and she was 22. Both of us had long black hair, some facial piercings, and we were occasionally mistaken for siblings. She had a girlfriend at the time who worked at one of the Walmarts in town. 
This Walmart was the one that I had never been to prior to this day. It was located in a part of town that I particularly didn't really like due to it being riddled with drugs and crime. Jen had asked me if I would drive her over to the Walmart so she could see her girlfriend on her break and have a quick cigarette with her. I told her yes because I figured it would be a quick and a little fun adventure since we weren't really doing anything else. It was early in the afternoon and I kept having a really uneasy feeling about going the entire time that I was driving there. I just felt like something bad was going to happen, but I brushed it off and just figured I was working myself up over nothing. When we pulled up and started walking towards the front doors, I noticed there was a car parked at the very front of the building with the hood popped. It was kind of in between the two separate entrances that most Walmarts have. There were three younger guys, 20 to 25 years old roughly, and they were leaning against the car and were just staring at us as we walked in. I figured they might have thought that we were pretty or something. However, I just couldn't help but get this horrible vibe from them. We walked inside and Jen went over to talk to her girlfriend and we all went outside to smoke a cigarette. On our way out the door, I noticed that the car was still parked in the very same spot with the hood popped up. And again, the guys had started staring at us again. I kept getting a really huge rush of anxiety and it just didn't feel right. I decided that maybe I was just nervous because I had never met Jen's girlfriend and maybe I'm just really socially awkward. We finished up our cigarettes and we walked back inside. While we were out there, many people had stopped and offered the young men help, but they just declined every time. I could see them shake their head no and I was far enough away that I could barely hear much, but I did hear them say that they had a friend coming to help them jumpstart their car. After we got inside, Jen said goodbye to her girlfriend and we talked about what we were going to do for the next couple of hours until her girlfriend was off work. We continued to discuss this on our way out the door. We were crossing the main driving area up in the front and walking to my car when one of those guys from that car then came running up to us. He was fairly good looking and he seemed like a normal 20 something guy. He had started to smile and he asked if we had any jumper cables to jump their car. Having heard them say earlier that their friend was on their way to jump their car, I figured they were getting impatient on waiting or their friend must have bailed on them or something. I told him that I did and that if he wanted me to jump the car, I can pull my car up there to help him out but he would have to connect the cable since I didn't really know where they hook up at. That's when he then said back, How about I just ride with you in your car so I can show you where our car is? Now this really struck me as extremely odd, so I just said back, I can see your car, it's the one parked right in the front of the building, right? Right at this time. I looked over at Jen who had the same expression of what the fuck is going on here on her face as I did. He then said, Yeah, but I could just ride with you guys because I can help guide you when you're driving up to the car. No, that's okay. I can drive up there myself. I said. This is when I really started to panic because we had been walking to my car this entire time when we were talking and I was almost to it. I had parked pretty far out in the parking lot as well so there weren't really many cars around and all the cars that were around were empty so there really wasn't anyone that I could call for help. The guy made one last plea by saying, Well, can I ride with you so I don't have to walk all the way back up there? It's really a far walk and you'll get to my car before I do. I finally had enough of this dude and trying to be nice and I said very sternly, Look dude, I'll jumpstart your car but you're not getting in my car. Fine he said, and he seemed pretty disappointed. We got in my car and Jen and I talked about whether we should even go help him now, all the while buckling our seatbelts. We ultimately decided that if we were in the front of the building, we should be fine since it was broad daylight and there were pretty much cameras everywhere and there was also quite a few people in the area. What we saw next made all of the blood rush out of my face. As we drove up to the parking row towards the front of the building where the car was parked at, I then saw the guy that we had just talked to running to the car while the other two guys slammed the hood shut, started the car, then peeled out of the parking lot right as the other guy got in the car. I parked my car in another space and I tried to call my fiance and tell him what happened and I asked him if he thought I should call the police. I was shaking and my eyes were tearing up. I had never felt that kind of fear before in my life. These guys just looked like your run-of-the-mill young and attractive guys. 
They were around my age, and I always thought that these kind of things were really only done by creepy older men. You know, the kind you shy your children away from based off looks alone. Not by young attractive guys who probably graduated high school in the last five years. I couldn't get a hold of my fiance and I just really wanted to get the hell out of there because I just didn't feel safe anymore. I ended up deciding not to call the police, which I still really regret to this day. It's been a little over three years now, and whenever I think about this, I really wonder what that guy would have done if I had let him get in my car. A couple of weeks after this happened, I was watching the local news with my sister and fiancé. They were running a story talking about an attempted kidnapping that had actually happened earlier that day at the very same Walmart that we had been to when our incident happened. They said that the unidentified individuals weren't caught, but they were posing as people with car trouble that needed help. I'm absolutely positive that it was the same set of guys that we encountered that day. I now won't go anywhere near that side of town unless I absolutely have to. And if I ever go to the store, I always make sure my fiance is with me. I live with my family here in Spokane, Washington. One Friday after school, my dad picks me and my little brother up and tells me we have to head over to the Sprague Walmart to pick up a few odds and ends for the following week. I was excited to just get home so I could start my weekend already, but I didn't mind going over to Walmart with him since I figured I could puppy dog eyes him into buying a few extra sweet treats for me to enjoy. That and the alternative was to walk home, and since it looked like it was going to rain, I know I'd chosen a better option. So we wander around Walmart for a little while, talking about how school is going and what our family plans were for the weekend. I get Dad to agree to drive me over to a friend's house the next morning in exchange for a promise that I'll get all my homework done that evening. A small price to pay since there's no way I'd be able to get over there on my own since she lives on the other side of town. So we get checked out, wheel the stuff out to the car, load up into the trunk, and then get ready to leave. But while we're driving out of the parking lot, a woman just sort of appears from nowhere and stands in front of my dad's car. She's wearing a red and black snapback with red hair falling out from under it, and a t-shirt that says love on it, with the O stylized as a heart. Her clothes aren't dirty or anything, but she looks seriously methed out. Few teeth were still in her mouth were all yellow and rotten, and her eyes were just like faded, like there was just nothing behind them. No thought or reason whatsoever. Then she just starts saying, This is my car. Pointing down at the hood like, How did you get in my car? At first my dad is fairly polite with her, but I can tell he's in no mood for messing around. He's all like, uh, Nah, lady, this ain't your car. And, Sorry, this must be a mistake. Can you please move out of the street? Thank you. And I can tell from the tone of his voice that he's about to get real mad with this lady real fast. But she won't move. She just stands there blocking our car and says, This is my car. Over and over again. That's when my dad turns to me in the back seat and asks if my phone has battery. I tell him yeah. And he tells me to start recording what's happening in case we need evidence to show the cops. My dad seems to give the lady one last chance to get out of the way and just loses his temper completely and starts barking at her like, Get out of the way! The meth head in front of our car then starts acting like she's the victim in this situation, saying stuff like, I just want to talk. I don't want violence. But I need to know how you got my car. Dad starts screaming at her again to get out of the way, and eventually she does. And we drive along thinking the whole thing is over, and she was just some crazy drugged out meth head with delusions. But the situation doesn't end there. We get to a set of traffic lights further on down the road, and someone else then steps in front of the car. This time it's a guy wearing a dark jacket with short hair and a mustache, like each of those scumbags look like they could have been paid extras on Breaking Bad, and he's putting on a similar act to the methed up lady, who managed to catch up by this point. He's all like, Can you get out? This is my car. And it's about that time I realized this was just a straight up attempt to carjack us. He wasn't like, Hey, this is my friend's car, and nothing like that. This is obviously some messed up plan that they put together to coerce some naive stranger out of their car so they could just steal it. The guy in front then puts his hand in the inside of his jacket, 
like he's about to get a gun out or something, but still remains all calm, like, Just talk to me, dude. This is my car. How did you get my car? Dad turns to my brother Max and tells him to call 911. Max is shaking like a leaf, and he does as he's told, getting his phone out and dialing 911, while my dad is still telling this guy in front of us to get out of the way. It's not just me and Max that are scared at this point. I can hear it in my dad's voice, too. And that really, really got to me. My dad is tough. Like, to me, he's the strongest man in the world, and up until that point, I'd never heard his voice go like that. It's something I don't think I'll ever forget. So as soon as Max has the 911 dispatcher on the line, Dad takes the phone off of him and starts explaining the situation to the person on the other end. As he's doing this, some guy with a beard, sunglasses, and a blue hoodie then starts walking over to the driver's side. Dad tells Max to lock his door, but because he's on the phone and slightly panicking by this point, he forgets to lock his own side. So this blue hoodie guy actually managed to open Dad's door all calm and asks, What are you doing? This is her car. While he points over at the meth head lady, Dad then replies all polite, This is not her car. Then tries to shut the door again. The guy flips, trying and flailing to pry open the door again before Dad shuts it, screaming to get out of the car, get out of the car, while kicking the driver's side door. If they had just came up to try to carjack us, that would have been bad enough. But the mind games they were trying to play with us was what was really scary. Like they expect us to just be like, oh I'm sorry, I didn't realize this was a car that some meth head could afford, we'll just get out and be on our way. God, it makes me so angry thinking about it now, but at the time, all I could do was burst into tears as I filmed the whole thing. Right then, some other meth head appears at the passenger's side where Max was sitting and starts banging on his side of the door too. Dad starts trying to drive around the gang that was now surrounding us, and the dark jacket guy then jumps on the hood of the car while another starts smashing a bicycle into the passenger door. Dad then seizes the opportunity and drives off down the avenue with one of the meth heads still lying on the hood. He's driving fairly slowly, talking to the 911 dispatcher the whole time, careful not to drive too fast in case the guy on the hood falls off and we accidentally run him over. But the next thing I know is there's this big roar of an engine to our right-hand side. The guy in the blue hoodie is on a motorcycle, revving the engine and preparing to give chase. He's pulling up alongside us, every so often to shout, Slow down! Slow down! Let the guy off! And Dad realizes he's talking about the guy lying on the hood. Dad slows down for like two seconds, and the guy on the hood, who is obviously realizing what a stupid situation he's got himself into, rolls off the hood, and runs over to the sidewalk to escape what could have amounted to a serious, life-changing injury. Not that he didn't deserve it, I just really didn't want to see my dad go to jail over something like that, when it most definitely was not his fault that this psycho was crazy or desperate enough to try to carjack us in such a terrifying way. After that, the biker guy stopped following us, he got home safe without anyone actually getting hurt. I was still crying. I was still crying as we pulled up outside her house, and even Max was really shaken up when he's normally so cool and nonchalant about everything. But I wasn't crying out of fear anymore. It was just pure relief and gratitude that Dad had handled the situation so well. We all hugged it out when we got inside, with Mom all panicked and wanting to know why we were all upset. I'll always remember Dad was like, I'm your father, and I'll always protect you when I can. I don't think I've ever loved him as much as I did in that moment. I don't really want to go into details about the interactions we had with the cops afterward. They insisted it was all just a misunderstanding, but anyone who was there would know it was so much more sinister than that. Those dirty meth heads were trying anything they could to slow us down and get us out of our car so they could steal it, and the fact that no one was arrested for it is something else that fills me with such rage even today. But there's a kind of uplifting ending. Since Dad posted the video online, a few people have reached out and offered to fix some of the damage and flip something else that fills me with such rage even today. But there's a kind of uplifting ending. Since Dad posted the video online, a few people have reached out and offered to fix some of the damage inflicted, which is nice. But it just reminds me like, if it really was, it just reminds me like, if it really was your car, why would you damage it like that just to get a person out? 
We know what happened that day. It was no misunderstanding. It was just a stupid plan to rob us that only a bunch of messed up crankheads could have even dreamed of. And it failed. Just like they failed in their miserable lives and ended up on the street having to rob people. I have no idea of the things that went wrong for them to end up like that. And maybe I shouldn't be so quick to judge them since I don't know what they've been through. But I do know one thing is for absolute certain. And that's that I have the best dad and I love him with all my heart. I'm a drug user, I'll admit it. Weed is my usual go-to, but I buy that off my friend. If I want to get something a little heavier, however, like acid or coke, I'd just order it off the dark web. It's surprisingly simple. A few clicks, some bitcoin transfers, and boom, I have acid in my P.O. box. But I'm also a curious guy. The dark web has always intrigued me. Up until a few days ago, I had only been on there to buy drugs off sites some of my friends gave me. But late one night, I was sober and at home, which was a rare thing for me. So since I was bored, I decided to boot up my tour browser and try and see what sort of messed up stuff I could find on the dark web. If you've ever been on the dark web, you'll know that you can't just search up red rooms or hitmen for hire and get results. No, you have to find links to these websites first. So I hopped back on Google, in an attempt to find some links to some messed up websites. I know it's weird that I was actively searching for the worst, but as soon as I got on the dark web that night, I had this weird sense of morbid curiosity that overcame me. Anyway, I spent a little while trying to find some links, but anything that I found was either too tame for me, or the links didn't even work. At this point, I was ready to give up, but in one final attempt, I clicked on reddit. I hopped on r slash deep web, but I didn't think I would find anything. I scrolled through the hot option for about half an hour before sorting to new, and that's when I found it. It was one simple text post titled Slayer's Assassination and Life Ruining Services. The text box of the post was what seemed to be a random assortment of numbers and letters. It took my tired brain a second to figure out what it was, but I realized pretty quickly it was a link presumably to a Hitman website. So I decided to paste the link into my dark web browser, and what do you know? It worked, but before I decided to go any further, I figured I should go back to the profile to see if they have posted any other dark web links, but when I went back to the post in question, the profile was deleted. Weird. Anyway, I reopened the dark web and hopped onto the site. Up along the top of the website was its name, Slayer's Assassination and Life Ruining Services, and next to it was what looked to be a skull inside of a crosshair. I chuckled when I saw it, I figured the site must have been fake. Upon scrolling down, however, I was not disappointed. There was a paragraph of white text on a black background, and a small box to the right of the text that just said place an order. The text was the main part though, as it took up most of the page. It proceeded to list all the forms of killing they were able to do. Again I laughed, this had to be satire, right? Hell, I was even tempted to order it on someone, just to see what would happen. Better not to risk it though, I thought to myself. I was about to close my computer and call it a night when I heard a knock at the door. I live alone, so it was unusual to get visitors, especially so late at night. But when I opened my door, it was just my good buddy Mark, who also happened to be my weed plug. As I opened the door, he didn't hesitate to let himself in and shove a huge bag full of pot in my face. He said he got a really expensive kind and asked if I wanted to try some with him. I couldn't say no. Cut to a couple hours later. It's early morning and Mark and I are chilling on my couch, both completely out of it at this point. He suddenly decides to get up and I assume he's going to get some leftover pizza, but he walks over to my desk and computer. Slayer's assassination? Are you going to kill someone or something? He mutters. What? I replied. Your computer, dude. It's got some hacker stuff on it. It's the dark web, man. Don't mess with it. I said. At this point, I'm still on my couch, half asleep and not paying full attention. However, I sat up pretty fast when I heard the words, Hey dude, let's order a hitman on you. I got up and walked over to my PC. Part of my brain was screaming no, but at the same time, with the state I was in, the majority of my brain was thinking about how funny it would be to order a hitman on myself. So I agree. At the end, after I wrote down all my personal details, like my address, my age, and even a photo of me, I had to select what I wanted to happen to me. 
I just selected plain old assassination, as it was actually cheaper than some of the other things. Anyway, I placed the order, and then replied to the confirmation email, and boom, it was done. A couple clicks and I had ordered myself a hitman on the dark web. Mark and I laughed for a while, but then he left about an hour later and I fell asleep not too long after. I woke up around 9am, which meant I got at least 6 hours of sleep, even if I felt like I got 3. I got up out of bed and brewed myself a coffee before sitting down to play some games and just enjoy my Sunday. But you can imagine how shocked I was when I saw I had ordered my own death the previous night. Even though I thought the site was BS, I still felt a pit open up in my stomach. Even when I'm high, I can usually make sensible decisions. I chuckled, not like I could remember it anyway. I would assume a normal human being would do something else, but I was still kind of out of it from the night before, so I just carried on with my day. I was a little paranoid, sure, but as I said, I just assumed it was BS. I even laughed at the email I got from the website, saying that the hitman had been dispatched and was on its way. Later that night, a blacked out sedan parked on the other side of the road from my house. I didn't see it arrive, but around the time I started to cook myself some dinner, I noticed it out the kitchen window. Now, I didn't live in a rural area, but there were a lot of trees and bushes between each of the houses on my street, so I would be surprised if any other house saw the car except for mine. At this point, I was freaking out. What if the sight was real? Even though I'm a big guy, I was still freaking out. I don't own any weapons, aside from a slightly larger than average kitchen knife. Screw it, I'm confronting it, I decided. I put on a hoodie and slid the kitchen knife into my front pocket before walking out of my house and right up to the driver's side window of the vehicle. Even I was astonished at my own courage. I knocked on the window, but nothing happened. It was rather anticlimactic. I was fully prepared to have a fight for my life, all because I did something really dumb while I was high off my mind. But, like I said, nothing happened. I even put my head right up to the window, as if there was a reflection, to try and get a better look to see what was inside. I could barely see anything, but I could make out two empty seats. No one was even inside. I had got all hyped up for nothing. I decided to wait out by the car for a bit, but after half an hour or so, I was hungry and had to go back inside to take my dinner out of the oven. I swear, it was only a minute between me going inside to take my dinner out of the oven and looking back out of the window, that the car was gone. I didn't even hear it leave. Yes, I'm eating my dinner with all my curtains closed and doors locked, I muttered to myself. I had just started to calm down when the power shut off. And coupled with the car, I now knew this was the real deal. I had signed my own death warrant. I ran into my upstairs bedroom and locked the door. I then hid under the bed. I figured I couldn't call the cops. What would I say? That I ordered a hitman on myself? So I just stayed hiding under my bed. And I still am now. I've been here for about an hour now. I know I'm screwed. Just a minute ago, I heard my back door slowly creak open. A package marked, return to sender. My neighbor's one of those annoying wannabe YouTube personalities. Over the years, I've seen him cough out cinnamon, lay flat on the hood of his car as it slowly creeps down the driveway, and douse himself in lukewarm water. All the while screaming epic win, epic fail, or fuck, epic maintenance of the status quo, for all I know. It can be tiring to watch him go about his shenanigans in the pursuit of viral fame. So, when he knocked on my door the other day, told me he was going away for a few weeks, and asked that I get his mail, honestly, it was a relief. I can't explain the peace of mind I had knowing I didn't have to brace myself for any of his stupidity for a while. I was always afraid his stunts would wind up bleeding over into my life. Things were pretty normal for the first couple of days. He received a few bills, a bit of spam, and what I could only assume was a birthday card. Then, one evening... I got home to find a cardboard box waiting on his front porch, in big red letters written, Return to Cinder. I'm no small fry, but I admit I had trouble lifting the box on my own. It was really freaking heavy. Lugging it across the road to my house was even harder, and I quickly realized there was no way I was going to drag it up the stairs, through my front door. I decided I'd leave his package in my garage. It wasn't like I kept my car in there. 
The garage door was a piece of shit that refused to open without a good thug or a whack. It was less trouble just leaving the car in the driving way than it was to fight with the garage door every morning and night. In hindsight, I should have set the package down while I struggled to open the tricky door. But you know how it is when you've got a good grip on something. No point in setting it down if you don't have to. It was as I kicked the door for a third time that I lost my grip on the package, and it fell to the ground. I heard a light crack inside. Shit! I cursed. I hope I hadn't broken anything important, but figured I just wouldn't tell my neighbor about it and let him assume the break happened en route. Hands free, I finally managed to get the garage door unstuck, and boy did it screech in protest as it rolled up and over me. I dragged the box the rest of the way, setting it in the corner for whenever my neighbor would come back to claim it. And then, I forgot all about it. Until a few days passed, that is. I'm not exactly sure how long it took for the smell to waft in from the crack under the garage to the house door, but it came in slow progression. It was a sickly sweet odor smell similar to a skunk. And for the first few days after I smelled it, I genuinely assumed that's exactly what it was. Roadkill that it left its mark on my house. It was only when I realized the scent was growing more intense instead of fading away that I looked for a source. That's when I opened the garage door, and that's when the odor knocked me back, holding my nose. The culprit wasn't hard to identify. The only change in my garage was the box in the corner. I remember thinking it must have been one of those meat of the month subscription boxes. The meat must have gone rancid from being left out from the fridge for so long. How much meat could have been in there for the box to have been so freaking large and heavy? An entire freaking cow? I covered my nose as I approached the box, a pair of scissors in my hands. I probably wouldn't have needed them to open it, as it had become soggy enough at the bottom to poke through with the finger. But I wasn't about to poke my finger into spoiled meat juices. That soggy bottom was the reason I had to open the box in the first place. If I tried to drag it out whole, everything would spill out onto the floor. I was going to have to dump the pieces of meat one garbage bag at a time and take them down to the dumpster, a process I wasn't looking forward to. My scissors tore through the tape along the top of the cardboard box. I thought the smell couldn't get any worse, but as I flipped the flaps open, I discovered a whole new gamut of stink. It was like opening a burning oven, but instead of a heat wave, I was met with waves of piss, sweat, and shit, and putrefaction. It was so bad that I staggered back and had to force down the puke, begging to guzzle out of me. I don't think I could have handled that scent mingled with the horrors coming out of the box. I'm not ashamed to admit I ran out of the door for a breath of fresh air, but in the short time I'd spent in the garage, the smell had become so ingrained in the fabric of my clothes that it clung to me like a shadow. Nothing I tried could keep the smell out of my nostrils. Not air fresheners, not a face mask, not three showers and a change of clothes. Every second that the box lay open in my garage was another second the smell was allowed to foothold into my house was another second the smell was allowed a foothold into my home. I had to bite the bullet. I returned to the garage, the flaps of the box still open as though inviting me to look. I was prepared, a clothespin pinning my nostrils shut, a garbage bag in one hand, the strongest cleaner I could find in the other, and long rubber gloves to keep my skin from having to touch what was inside. But as it turns out, I needed none of those things. I wouldn't have to touch or clean the contents of that box. I would only have to suffer the nightmares every night. You see, there was meat in that box, but it didn't come from a cow or a pig. No, it was worse than that. It was my neighbor, dead. Still in one piece, but dead. I called the cops and naturally they took me in for interrogation. It's kind of hard not to suspect the man with a corpse in his garage after all. Thankfully, they soon realized I wasn't involved. My DNA might have been all over that box, the smell might have left a mark throughout my house, but there was one piece of irrefutable evidence in my neighbor's own hands that proved my innocence. A vlogging camera. They showed me the footage only once. I'm not sure if they were allowed to, or if they felt so bad for me they figured it couldn't hurt. Either way, I saw it. My neighbor was sitting in the box outside of a shipping facility, laughing as he told the world how he was going to mail himself across state lines. He'd brought pee bottles, food, a pillow, and a few flashlights. His friends, a guy I'd seen in his place several times to help with his stunts, closed the lid and presumably dropped him off for shipment. Throughout the next couple of hours or days, I'm honestly not sure, my neighbor recorded a few short clips about his progress. I think I'm in a truck now. 
I can feel it moving. Must be in a warehouse. Pretty warm here. Still got plenty of food. That kind of stuff. The box toppled over. He broke his neck and that was it. The camera recorded until either the memory card got too full or the battery died. There's one thing I didn't tell the police after they showed me the video. One thing I heard in the footage that will haunt me to the day I die. Just after the tumble that broke his neck, I heard the familiar screeching sounds of my garage door. I remember when I first downloaded the Tinder app. I was filled with excitement and new hope. I had not been in a relationship for a while now and was really looking forward to a new beginning. My ex-boyfriend had moved to another city a year ago and I really needed to move on. I created my profile and started swiping. Most of the profiles I came across were either fake or not my vibe. After days of swiping and multiple failed matches, I finally came across this guy who was really handsome and seemed down to earth and humble. I remember thinking to myself, it would be really nice if this worked out, and I swiped right. To my surprise, it was an instant match. A rush of happiness filled up my body and brought a smile to my face. His name was Jason. We started talking to each other and he seemed really nice. A few days passed by and I wonder why he hadn't asked me out yet. I tried dropping as many hits as I could, but it was of no use. So I asked him out. This is when things started to get a little weird. Let's go out and grab coffee someday, I texted. He replied saying, sure, someday. When? I asked. What he said next really creeped me out. When your soul leaves the mortal world. That got me a little worried. I assumed he was joking, maybe. But even if so, that's a real morbid sense of humor. As I stared at the chat thinking what I should reply, the doorbell suddenly rang. That startled me. It was late at night. Who could that possibly be? I slowly made my way to the door and with a lot of hesitation, opened it. Surprise, girl! A loud voice yelled. It was my best friend, Trisha. I brought wine and chips, she said. I was happy to see her. We had not been friends too long, but we were close. As we sipped on wine and binge watched horror movies, I decided to tell her about Jason. I pulled up my phone, opened Tinder, and showed her Jason's profile. And just as I did, that smile I saw on her face faded away. A serious look gripped her face. She looked at me and said, is this a joke? What's wrong? I replied. She said, this guy died three years ago and he used to live in this same house you're living in right now. That moment I heard that I got goosebumps. Trisha then went on to explain how this guy named Jason used to live in my house before me with his girlfriend. One night he slit her, one night he slit her throat while she was sleeping and then killed himself. The authorities deemed him mentally ill. She showed me the news headlines on the internet to prove she was telling the truth. I never saw this coming. Was I really talking to the spirit of a dead man? How could this be possible? The next day I thought to myself, this has to be some kind of prank. It has to be a fake profile someone created with his name and photos. I picked up my phone and opened Tinder and decided to confront the man behind the profile. But it was gone. Jason's profile had been deleted all of a sudden. I thought to myself, at least it's over. And I immediately uninstalled the app. Later that night as I sat home alone watching TV, I heard a loud bang on my door. Trisha? I said out loud. I opened the door to see nobody. That's strange, I thought. I shut the door and locked it behind me. At this point, I was starting to get a little paranoid. Later that night when I was asleep, I heard a loud bang again. This time, it came from inside the house. My dog immediately started to get restless. I slowly made my way down as I switched on the light. I got the shock of my life. Everything in my living room was out of place and scattered across the floor. Someone or something was inside my house. I began to realize that something sinister is happening to me. I never slept for the rest of the night and sat with a baseball bat right next to me. As dawn broke, I called the police and explained what happened. They looked around the house and found no evidence of a break-in. When I told them about Jason and the whole tender scene, they said what I actually expected them to say. It's probably a prank, ma'am. Don't get too worried. This is a safe neighborhood. None of the officers seemed to believe the possibility that it's more than just a prank. 
The next night, I slept with the lights on. In the middle of the night, I heard my dog barking and growling violently. To my surprise, he wasn't in the house. As I looked out the window, I saw my dog on the front yard. How did he get out? I said to myself as I ran downstairs. My door was wide open, and my dog was just staring into the darkness in front of him, just growling. What is it, boy? What do you see? As I focused my vision ahead, I saw a dark shadow in the distance. It looked right towards me. I couldn't see a face, just a black shadow standing there. I lost my calm and fell into a state of fear. I caught my dog's collar and slowly walked backwards towards my house. I got in and locked the door. As I peeped out the window, the shadow figure had disappeared. Who was that? I thought. Was that the spirit of a dead man? I was scared. I knew I was being haunted. I had unknowingly invoked the spirit of a dead man when I started talking to Jason. I realized this was going to be a long night, and as I looked at the time, I noticed all the clocks in my house had stopped working. At the same time, they all froze at 3.06 AM. I felt threatened and helpless. The next night, the paranormal activities continued. I kept hearing footsteps coming from the other rooms. I get this constant feeling that I wasn't alone in the house. The lights flickered every now, and at one point, I felt something touch the back of my neck. This is when I realized things were getting out of hands, and if the police were not going to take me seriously, I had to find someone who would. The next day, I called a priest to bless the house, and as he stepped in, he immediately told me he felt a dark presence lurking around. He said some prayers and sprayed holy water all over. I was never a religious person, but at this point, I was desperate for help. I had hoped the strange activities would stop now, and well, they did. The next night was peaceful. As the days passed by, I was less scared, and things started to go back to normal. Then, one night a few weeks later, I heard a loud bang in the middle of the night, just when I thought my nightmare was over. It happened again, but this time, it was far worse. As I made my way down to the door, my dog started growling. I opened it to find a bloody knife at my doorstep. If I remember correctly, Jason had slit his girlfriend's throat with a knife. I immediately realized this haunting wasn't over. In fact, it was just beginning. One morning, I was on my way to college with my friends. As I reached college, I asked my friends if they would like to come over for lunch later on that day. Both my friends Debbie and Jennifer said that they had other plans. Debbie was going bowling with her boyfriend, and Jennifer was going trekking with her boyfriend. It was at this point that I felt lonely and left out. Both of my friends were dating, and I had no one. That's when I decided to download Tinder. Up until this point, I had never been in a relationship before. I finished college and went on for soccer practice just like I did every day since I was on the soccer team of my college. I was always athletic since I was a child and spent most of my time playing some sport or another. My dad was really proud of this. I reached home and installed Tinder that day. I began a swipe. Left. Left. Right. Left. I didn't expect much from the app, but I tried anyway. After a few days, I got my first ever match. It was a guy named Tom. He had brown hair and the brightest smile I had ever seen. We began chatting and got familiar with each other pretty quick. We decided to meet later that weekend. I met him and we went out for dinner. During dinner, he spoke about many things like how he has never been on a flight before and that he likes camping in the woods nearby sometimes. As we were talking, he asked, have you ever dated anyone before? No, I replied. That immediately seemed to make him more enthusiastic about me. So that means you are pure. I wasn't sure what he meant by that, and I said, If by pure you mean a virgin, then yes. That's perfect. He replied with a smirk on his face. I found it rather odd he used a word like pure. And the fact that he was asking me questions like these on our first date started to make me a little uncomfortable. I told him it was getting late and I had to get home soon. He said, Why don't we take a walk in the woods? I know a path that's a shortcut to the area you live in. I personally wasn't a fan of the woods and said that I had to get home soon. However, he was very insistent. It will be romantic, he said, and it'll give us some more time to get to know each other. At this point, I should have just said no, but this was the first time I'd ever been on a date, and I did not want to mess it up. And moreover, it was nearly 10 p.m., and I knew it would be difficult to find a cab home that late at night in our small town. And so, I said yes. As we walked out of the diner and made our way into the woods, he pulled out a bottle of whiskey from his jacket pocket and took a sip of it. He offered me some, but I denied. I wasn't such a big fan of alcohol, to be honest. 
He kept trying to convince me to take a sip, and I finally caved. Just one, I said, and took one sip. That gave me a bit of a high. Before I knew it, one became two, and two became three. We were now pretty deep in the woods, and I asked, How much longer? Not too long. By this point in time, I was slightly drunk. A few minutes later, he said, I have to go pee. Way right here. And he walked deeper into the woods until I lost sight of him. I had started to get a little worried now. All I could think of was getting home, and here I was alone in the woods, late in the night. As I stood there, I heard footsteps coming from my right. Tom? I shouted. There was no answer. Then I heard some footsteps on my left. I realized I wasn't alone, but I kept thinking, maybe it's Tom. As I walked closer to the footsteps, I heard voices. Not just one voice, but at least two or three different ones. I couldn't make out what they were saying. I slowly walked closer to the place I'd heard the voice from. And then suddenly, blackness. I felt someone put a bag over my head from behind me, and another person immediately caught my hands. I screamed as loud as I could, and the moment I did, I felt a hard hit on my head. I had been knocked unconscious. The next thing I saw as I slowly woke is a small fire in front of me. As my vision cleared, I saw a group of people dressed in long red robes with a hoodie that covered their faces. I was confused. I did not know what was happening. I only knew what I could see, and that was the fact that I'm still in the woods and that I'd been knocked out. I realized that I'd been kidnapped. I had duct tape over my mouth. My hands were tied behind my back. I'm going to die today, I thought to myself. I've been kidnapped. I'm going to be killed. I kept thinking. As I looked to my right, I saw another girl who was tied down just like me only a few feet away. Where did she come from? Who was she? I wondered. She looked right at me with tears in her eyes. It felt as if she knew what was about to happen next. I noticed strange markings on the trees around me. There were symbols I had never seen before. And then I heard a voice I recognized. Ah, you're awake. Good. I instantly recognized it as Tom's voice. He stood right in front of me in the red robe. He pulled the duct tape off my mouth. I yelled, What's going on? Let me go! Tom replied, Now why would I do that? Do you know how hard it is to find someone pure these days? He then turned back to the rest of the group and said, We can begin now. Two men in red came and picked up the girl beside me and dragged her ahead. The poor girl kicked and screamed, but the men were too strong for her. They formed a circle around her and stripped her. I was trembling in fear as I watched. They started reciting some words in an unknown language. The chants got louder and louder. In this moment, I realized what was happening. This was some sort of evil satanic ritual. The markings on the trees, the red robes, the chants. I had been kidnapped by a satanic cult, and I was just about to witness a human sacrifice. My heart started pounding and I felt dizzy. I could not believe what was happening. I realized that I was going to be next. I did not want to die. I started crying. As the men in red chanted, one of them pulled out a knife and slowly walked to the girl, who was in the center of their circle. He split a cut in her arm, and then, on the other arm, they gathered around her and one by one, licked the blood that was dripping from her arm. The chants continued. The girl was screaming and screaming, but with the duct tape on her mouth, it did not make any difference. The man with the knife started cutting symbols into her naked body. A few minutes later, the chanting stopped. The girl lay there bleeding out with all these satanic symbols cut into her skin. She was shivering and shaking, and I couldn't imagine the pain she felt. The men, one by one, walked to the fire, picked up a stick of burning wood. They circled around her and all at once leant forward and touched the flaming stick to her body from all directions. They were burning her alive, but slowly and painfully. As they did that, they all started chanting in that unknown language again. As I watched them sacrifice this girl, I heard a voice in my head. You have to get out of there. I immediately realized I needed to try and escape, because in a few minutes, I was going to be their next sacrifice. I kept pulling at the rope they tied my hands with, and somehow a miracle happens. I managed to get my hands free. I knew I was going to have to make a run for it. The moment I stood up, one of the men in red screamed, She's escaping! The whole cult suddenly turned towards me. I turned around and ran ran as fast as I could. I could hear the men from the colt running behind me. I kept running until I finally reached the main road, where an old couple driving by immediately agreed to give me a lift. All that cardio I built during soccer practice finally came in handy. I went to the police station and told the cops everything. My parents came and took me home. The next day, an officer dropped by our house. 
and told us that they could not catch anybody from this satanic cult. By the time they reached the site of the ritual, all that was left was the burnt body of the young girl who was kidnapped with me. I was filled with a deep sadness. I wish I could have done something to help her, but honestly, I was just glad that I made it out alive. I was never going to use Tender again. A few weeks passed, but the memory of that night still is crystal clear in my mind. I woke up one morning and as I stepped out the door to head to college, I saw what I wish I had never seen again. All the trees in our front yard had been marked with symbols. The same symbols the trees in the forest were marked with that night. Satanic symbols. My whole body froze as I realized this wasn't over. They were going to come for me again. The cult still wanted to sacrifice me and there was nothing I could do to stop them. I'm a female, and at the time this story occurred, I was 15. My best friend Ellie would spend a lot of time in my house. I kind of just assumed that this was because she had two younger siblings that she didn't really get along with well, and the father wasn't in the picture, and their mom was gone most of the time. Every weekend, Ellie would stay at my house. On this particular weekend, I'd asked Ellie if maybe we could stay at her house instead. I was just kind of wanting a break from my parents and I had never stayed over at Ellie's house before. Her mother said that it would be fine and that she wasn't going to be home much anyway. We went to Ellie's house straight after school on a Friday. We sat down on the couch and we had watched some TV for a bit. After a while, we decided we wanted a snack and we went into the kitchen to see what we could find. They had a side door and their kitchen was open with a screen on the outside. I was very startled when I saw a man standing in front of the screen door looking inside. He looked to be in his late 30s and he was really dirty and shaggy looking. I actually wondered if he was homeless. Once we made direct eye contact with him, he then said, Well, well, well. Hello there, young ladies. Dave, Ellie said. She told this guy Dave that her mom wasn't there. The man replied back, Yeah, she never is. Who's your little friend here? He asked as he creepily looked me up and down. She told him I was her friend and that we were just hanging out having a sleepover. Ellie seemed uncomfortable, and I was too. He stood there for a moment just smiling at us when he then said, So are boys allowed? I'm sure a couple of cuties like you have boyfriends coming over. We grew increasingly uncomfortable and Ellie told him that she had to watch her brother and sister for the night and that her mom would be home later. I knew that wasn't true though. Her siblings were staying at her dad's that weekend and her mom would be going out with her boyfriend, so most likely she wouldn't be coming home. The man was still standing at the door smiling at us. He then said, Oh well, I guess. Tell your mom I stopped by. See you sexy ladies later. When the man walked away, I asked Ellie what was that all about. She told me that Dave was her neighbor. Apparently her mom had gone on a date with him several years ago when they first moved in. Her mother wasn't impressed with Dave, and there was no second date. She said that he was cheap, had bad hygiene, not at all interesting, and was far too forward sexually. I guess this Dave character would stop by frequently trying to get the mom's attention and then flirt with her, much to everyone in the household's dismay. Ellie also said in the last couple of years, he seemed to start taking more interest in her, even making the horrific comment about how she's grown up enough to wear bras now and suggesting that she should come over in a bikini to sunbathe on his deck. I was totally horrified. What a creep. We tried to relax some and forget about the creepy neighbor. We ate some junk food, watched some of our favorite shows, and also took some quizzes out of teen magazines. It was getting dark and we were starting to want dinner, so we ordered a large cheese pizza. Not even ten minutes later after the pizza had arrived, there was a knock at the front door. We were both really surprised as it was going on 9pm at this point, and we weren't expecting anyone. Ellie got up and looked out the peephole. She looked right back at me wide-eyed. She put her finger up to her mouth and told me to be quiet. There was another knock at the door, then a voice. It was Dave. Girls, I know you're home, he said. We were both frozen in fear. Then Dave the Creep said something along the lines of that he knew we were alone and saw that we were hungry for a pizza, and so he thought he'd bring us a large sausage. Yeah, I know. Cringe. After a few minutes of not responding, Dave said something about us being stuck up little girls and then left. We went around the house closing all the blinds and making sure all the doors were locked. We were so scared that we barely had the volume of the TV up, 
and kept the room lit with one tiny dim lamp out of fear of Dave seeing or hearing us. Once it got to be around 10.30, we were really fed up with having to sit still in the dark. Ellie got up and peeked out the window at Dave's house. She said that all of his lights were off, so he probably went out or went to bed. We felt comfortable enough to turn on some lights and relax a bit, so we put on some music and chatted some. We were sitting on the piano bench in front of the dining room windows when all of a sudden we then heard a tapping outside the window. I guess we had only closed the shades halfway because when we looked over, you guessed it, there was Dave peeking in. He held up a six pack of beer saying that he knew Ellie's mom wasn't home and that we should let him in so we can all party together. I guess Ellie had enough at this point because she stood up and yelled at him, no, and that he needed to leave. Dave had a completely blank look on his face, and then he said, You know I can just come in, right? Ellie then yelled at him that she had spoken with her mom, and she was calling the police. Well, at that point, Creeper Dave started to back away, saying he was just kidding and that we needed to calm down. Ellie stood her ground until she knew Dave was in his house, then proceeded to call her mom's boyfriend's house. She told her mom all the creepy things Dave had been doing, but her mom didn't believe us and she thought we were making things up. She said we should just go to bed and everything would be fine. Ellie was so upset. We ended up locking ourselves upstairs in her mother's bedroom. We didn't have any more problems with Dave that night and we finally got some sleep. After that night, as you can imagine, we decided to just go back to sleepovers at my house and I think that's for the best. My son Eli found it one day while walking on a trail in between two schools. It was a small patch of green, surrounded by tall pines and myrtles all around. I didn't remember seeing it any time previously during our walks, but the place looked rather old. There wasn't much to it, just some swings, a jungle gym, and a single slide. But as soon as Eli saw it, he wanted to go and play immediately. Something about the place felt immediately wrong to me. It was too quiet, too still. There was a slow fog drifting along the grass. Eli, be careful! I called out. Of course. Being only three and a half, he didn't listen. So I sat on the bench nearby and watched him play. I took out my phone to check Facebook and Twitter, telling him we could stay for maybe 15 minutes at the most. I needed to shoot a few messages to my mechanic and insurance company. So admittedly, I was absorbed in business. As my eyes occasionally glanced up to make sure he wasn't getting hurt, I saw someone else standing there just on the outskirts of the playground. He was a tall man with a perfectly ironed white shirt and pressed dark pants. He was just standing there, staring, watching us. Eli, we need to get home, I called out. The man was making me uncomfortable. My son whined but listened to me as we continued down the trail. The man didn't stop watching us until we were out of sight. Mom, I didn't want to go, Eli said as we made it back to the SUV. He climbed in through my side to get into the back seat. We can come back another day, buddy, I told him. Truth be told, I didn't want to go back to that playground at all. Everything about it was giving me a very bad vibe. But I didn't like lying to Eli. And I figured that as long as the weird guy wasn't there, it would be harmless. So the next weekend, I walked him back there and let him enjoy it. He was smiling from ear to ear. I noticed also there were other children running around, so that put me at ease. But then, as I watched, I also noticed that none of their parents were there. These are five-year-olds or younger. How could any parent with a grain of salt just let them wander out here? This trail isn't exactly well known, in fact, before we found the playground, I would say I almost never saw anyone. So where were these kids coming from? Their laughter was more intoxicating than the fog. I tried to approach one of the children to ask their name, but they were too shy. In fact, they all seem adverse to even talking to me altogether. I got that uneasy feeling in my gut again and called Eli to leave. This time, he was even more upset. I don't want to leave. I hadn't seen him this mad since he was sick, and I'd promised to let him play outside. Probably the last time I'd failed to keep my word. Buddy, we can't stay here forever. Come on, I insisted, but Eli wouldn't listen. 
he ran to the top of the slide and sat down defiantly. I hated to be mean, but I didn't want this habit to continue, so I snatched him down and scolded him. Don't run away from me like that, I told him. Eli looked confused. I knew he still didn't understand why he always had to listen to me. It broke his heart when we left. The other kids just stopped and stared as we walked away, like they were sad to see him go too. Another day, Eli told me that he missed his friends. Which one, sweetie? I asked. At the hidden playground, he said. The name he gave it was disconcerting, but fitting given the fact that it did seem hard to find. In fact, when Eli wasn't with me, I couldn't find it at all, even when I tried. I don't think we should go back there again, bud. It doesn't seem safe. That equipment is rather old, I told him. I tried to reach a compromise and tell him I could take him to one of the other parks around town, but Eli wouldn't listen. It's special, he whined. He was getting to be temperamental, and as much as I wanted to make him happy, my instincts told me to put my foot down. I just want you to be safe, I told him as he cried in my arms. Eli didn't talk to me for a few days. I guess he figured the silent treatment would change my mind, but I kept firm and didn't even go towards the trail again. Eli got sadder and sadder, refusing to even eat or sleep. All he seemed to care about was going back to that place. It made me worried. Was there something wrong with him? He was always in his room and rarely came out. Finally, I gave in and told him we could go back one last time. You should have seen his face light up, like a kid at Christmas. He was so happy as we made it towards the creepy swings. But my defenses immediately returned when I saw the tall stranger nearby. Why was he always here, watching these children play? Eli, stay close where I can see you, I told my son. The man was approaching and offered to push him on the swing. Don't touch my boy, I warned the stranger. Mom, I'm going to be okay, Eli said in frustration. For three years old, he always acted like he was 30. He is safe with me. I'll call the cops, I said angrily, but the man paid me no mind. He helped my son into the swing and began to push. The smile on Eli's face was so big. I was in a mix of emotions trying to decide how best to handle the situation. Look how happy he is here, the stranger gestured to the other children nearby. They hadn't been there a moment before, they all are. The way he said it made a chill run up and down my spine. Their laughter kept echoing in the still air. What is this place? I asked. I keep them safe until they are ready to move on. The stranger explained softly. He was looking at Eli and seeing him laugh. It sounded so perfect. Move on? I repeated. His words made sense, but they sounded hollow and distant. When they are ready, they stay here. He added, I felt my mouth go dry. My son got off the swing and started chasing after some of the other kids. Stay? He can't stay, I said desperately. My hands were shaking. I felt paralyzed. I called to Eli to leave, but he wouldn't listen. It's okay to let go, the man insisted. He touched my hand and smiled. Eli ran up next to me and tugged at my pants. Mommy, mommy, there's a tree house and a merry-go-round. Can I go, mommy? Can I? I don't think I can remember a time he was happier. I got down on my knees and ruffled his hair. Under the hairline, I saw the scar that ran across his head from where the car had struck him. The truth hit me like a ton of bricks and tears welled up in my eyes. It was time to let go. Sure, bud. <laughs> Go have fun. He hugged me as tight as he could and then ran towards the tree line. The man followed behind and then nodded toward me in thanks. A moment later, they were gone. I stood there a moment longer, transfixed by the sights I had just seen, watching as the swings and the slides faded away, until nothing was left but the green grass. I go there from time to time now to lay flowers down. Sometimes I see another parent doing the same, as we share a bond of silence over our loss. And sometimes I hear the children laughing, and I know they are where they are meant to be. I wasn't careful enough on the deep web. The deep web is one of the most amazing things on earth. 
Not because of how joyful it makes people or anything, but because it is a completely uncensored view of people. You can speak your minds, buy what you want, do anything you want. When on the deep web, you have complete and total freedom. I had always been fascinated by the deep web. And at the time the events in this story occurred, I was in college. Lots of people on my campus had been really getting into accessing the deep web. It was almost like a trend. With so many people getting on it, it seemed perfectly safe for me to give it a try. I mean, why not? Now, I had always heard of the deep web horror stories. Stories of hacking, stumbling on disgusting sites, and, and people even somehow finding your address. These stories were mainly what kept me off the deep web, but with most of the people at my college using it on a normal basis, I decided to give it a go. I asked a friend to come over and help me set it up. When my friend arrived, we opened up my laptop and began to set everything up. He told me that we were using Tor, a program that lets you access the deep web. He also asked me if I was planning on doing anything illegal, to which I replied no. He said that since I wasn't, we did need to install Tails, which is apparently a software that makes it more secure if you plan on doing illegal things. A little while later, everything was set up. I had my new IP address, and my friend gave me a brief rundown of what to do and what not to do. He made it very clear that when I was using the hidden wiki, that I kept it on censored mode, so that it would be less likely for me to see something I didn't want to see. After about two weeks of using the deep web, I felt like a pro. I'd accessed many different sites, spoken with some great people, made friends. I'd become cocky and was ready to dig deeper into the dark web. I turned off the censored mode on the hidden wiki and began to browse the links. It took a while, mostly because Tor is a bit slow, and many of the links just lead to dead web pages. Eventually, I stumbled on a chat room called All the Gore. It was mainly a big chat room with many different topics. I had a fairly strong stomach. I had seen many violent movies and had seen beheadings, killings, etc. Though through the normal internet. After looking at a few different chat rooms, I noticed how sick this site really was. The people in this chat room were actually killers, bragging about some of the things they had done. In the chat room, you could also post pictures. One man by the name of Culture045 had the stage in one of the chat rooms. He was explaining in detail how he had broken into someone's house, kidnapped a little girl, and brutally killed her parents by hiding under their bed and then opening their throats. He then explained how he brought the little girl back to his house and cut her up. I didn't think he was telling the truth at first, but then he posted pictures. They were the most horrifying pictures I had ever seen. The new ones were of the girl tied to a chair, bleeding, crying, throwing up, etc. Then he showed a picture of him with a drill. The most haunting part of that was while he was doing it. He was looking at the camera with sheer joy on his face. I had seen enough and typed in the chat room window, you people are sick and deserve to die. How can you sleep at night? Immediately, people began making fun of me, saying that I was just as helpless and ignorant as a little girl in the pictures and that I should get off the big boy part of the internet. They started calling me a pussy and calling me an empath when Culture typed something in the chat box. He said, Really? Where do you live, buddy? I'm sure everybody would love to see you on this site. I then made the biggest mistake of my life and typed, I'm calling the police and I'm gonna have this site shut the fuck down. Less than a minute later, everything on the site went black and a new chat box appeared in green. In it, Someone named Admin1 typed in the box. He said, call the cops and you will regret it. I didn't type anything in the box and reached for my cell phone. What happened next haunts me to this day. My phone said I had a new message. I opened it and it said, call the police and you're dead. There was no number. It didn't even say unknown number. It was just blank. I looked back at my laptop and saw my webcam light turn on. I quickly covered it, but saw on the screen a picture of me looking at my phone. I got wide-eyed and froze for a moment when the admin typed again, put the phone down right now, 
and uncover your webcam. I put my phone down, but kept the webcam covered. When he typed again, okay then, be like that. Right after, he posted my full name, age, and address in the chat box and typed, it would be a shame if you or your college buddies went missing, wouldn't it? He said, I then did as he said and uncovered my webcam. He then told me to follow his instructions on how to make it impossible for me to reach the site again. I followed each and every one. When I finished, I got a text that said, Now don't ever try to come back. Just like before, it had no number. I still called the police from my friend's phone, but they were never able to find the site. If you ever go on the deep web, don't ever just mindlessly explore, especially if you don't have additional software to keep you more secure. I was a stupid college kid, and I just hope nobody makes the same mistakes I did. I moved to a different home and changed all of my information, but I still get nightmares to this day. I was extremely rattled by what had happened. The police tried to track down the website, but since there was no way for them to recover my history, and I had originally found the sick site by just randomly clicking links, it seemed pretty hopeless to find it. The police told me to change all my information about myself and to move in with the friends. After changing pretty much all of my information, I decided to move in with my friend David. David was an extremely hardworking and honest person. He never went to parties, slacked off, got drunk, or high. He was just really dedicated to finishing college. In fact, he was one of the few kids I knew at the time who wasn't getting on the deep web regularly. I had told him all about my experience with the deep web, and that's mostly why he agreed to let me stay with him. One night, we were both up studying very late when my phone went off. I looked up to see who had texted me, and I saw that the person sending the message had no number, just like last time. It read, check your computer. There was nothing else to it, just one simple instruction. I opened my laptop and when I did, I noticed that I didn't have control of the mouse. I tried to move it, but the mouse had just moved on its own. Someone had remote access to my computer somehow. I never gave anyone remote access before. I tried a whole bunch of keyboard commands, but not a single one worked. I noticed that whoever had control of my laptop was downloading software. Most likely malware, but there was nothing I could do. I heard my phone go off again, and this time the message said, Look out your window. I was sitting right by the window. I didn't know which window the guy was referring to, so I looked out the one I was sitting by and saw a man in the parking lot leaning up against a white van. He had a phone in his hands, and when I looked at him, he nodded. My phone went off again. Type in and hold down Shift Alt F5 at the same time to activate the software. I called David to my room to show him what was going on. He seemed just as nervous as I was. We didn't want to anger him. David called the police right away and told me that they would be there soon. I didn't activate the software and just sat there. Eventually, I got another text. I am coming in if you don't do it right now. I didn't know why he or the person in control of my computer couldn't do it, but I didn't dare to ask. At the same time though, I was 99% sure that this program had malware or spyware or something that was very harmful to my computer. So I refused to activate it. David grabbed a baseball bat just in case the man outside tried to come in. About five minutes later, we heard the doorknob turning. It was locked, but we then heard banging at the door. We both freaked out and looked out the window again. Sure enough, the man and the van were gone. The banging on the door got more and more violent until eventually we heard a horrible scratching sound. It lasted a few minutes and then we heard footsteps walk down the hall and eventually fade away. I received another text. We will be back. That really got to me. When the cops arrived, they told me to look at my door. I followed them back out in the hallway and saw engraved in our door, my name. The police began investigating the whole building and they had a tech police officer come in and look at my computer. He began to do scans and investigate the weird software on my laptop. Eventually, he managed to close and remove it and told me that my laptop isn't safe. He said that the core files had been hacked into or corrupted. 
The next day, I had just got home from school and was really tired. David wasn't home yet, so I went to my room and fell into bed. I had just begun to close my eyes when I heard a rattling sound in my closet. I lifted my head up and didn't hear it again. So, I went back to sleep. After a few minutes, the closet door swung open. I leapt out of bed and saw a man with a mask walking over to me. I ran for the door and slammed it behind me. I ran out to the parking lot, started my car, and drove away as fast as I could. By the time the police had arrived, the man was of course gone. The apartment surprisingly had not been wrecked or anything. We didn't even find anything stolen. He didn't seem to do anything at first. This night, two police officers were monitoring everyone who came in or out of the building in order to catch the man. I opened my laptop and noticed that my wallpaper had changed. It was just a bunch of trees, but it had been changed to a sickening photo of a man with a mask. The same mask that I saw on the man who was in my closet, digging a knife into a man's eye in what looked like a small cabin. I also noticed that all of my applications and programs were gone, and I saw the same software as last time, right in the middle. I clicked on it, and it had already been installed. Just like last time, it filled the entire screen, and what looked like a live stream was going on. I couldn't exit out, and the live stream was coming from a boy's house. He looked about 13 or 14, and was at his computer. It didn't take long for me to see that I was watching through his webcam, and he had no idea. I saw a small chat box pop up in the top right of the screen, and someone typed in the box, Welcome to our live stream. We are glad everyone could be here. Thank you, John, for being here as well. My eyes got very wide. My name was John, and they were waiting until I was watching to start the live stream. As I watched, I saw that the closet door behind the poor boy slowly opened, and a man walked out with a toolbox in one hand. He quietly set the toolbox down and pulled out some duct tape. He went behind the kid and put the tape over his mouth and grabbed him tight. The poor kid's face was in total fear. He tried to scream, but he couldn't because of the tape. They were making a decent amount of noise, so it told me that the kid must have been home alone. I tried hard to exit out, but I couldn't. I then saw the man take out a screwdriver and drive it into the kid's chest. Blood began to pour out and the kid made a full wheezing type noise. I saw tears come from his eyes and the sick man began to drive the screwdriver deeper and deeper and deeper and then yank it out. The man then took out a hammer and smashed the kid's hand several times till they were nothing more than a mangled bloody mess. I tried every command I could to exit out but nothing was working. I noticed that in the chat box several people were cheering the man on and requesting for him to do different things to the boy. The man then took out a handheld electric saw pressed it against the boy's face and turned it on. The boy screamed with pain as the saw went up into his eye, causing blood to go everywhere and even get on the camera a little. I started to get tears in my eyes and I couldn't stop it. Then the man took the screwdriver, gouged out the kid's eyes and took out a large knife. He proceeded to slit the boy's throat and toss him on the ground. I was sick. I threw up all over the floor. And when I looked back, I saw the chat box. People typing in horrible things like fap, 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 or oh my god, that was so wonderful. Thanks so much for doing this, etc. In the box, I saw someone named Culture045 type into the box. Thanks for watching, John. After that, the program closed on its own, and I was left with the sickening wallpaper. I was sweating, breathing heavily and feeling sick. Throughout the entire thing, I didn't realize that my phone had gone off several times. I looked at it, and the most hateful, mean messages were coming from my friends and family. I asked my mom what was wrong, and she texted back, you sent that sick, disturbing live stream to everyone. John, I can't believe who you are. I called the police on you, John. I felt even more sick than before. Those monsters had sent the live streams to all my friends somehow and made it come from me. They had pretty much ruined my life within a couple of minutes. When the police arrived, I told them everything that had happened. And quickly, they managed to explain to all my friends and family what had happened. 
they really cracked down on finding these people. And about a month later, four men had been arrested. One was Culture 045. The other was Admin 1. And the two others were working with him. The site was found and shut down as well. And I got a new laptop and phone. I could say some horror cliche here and say something like, I kept getting texts or kept hearing weird things ever since. But none of that ever happened. They were arrested and I never heard anything further. It's good to know that those men are in jail or perhaps even dead. But what scares me is all the other people watching the live stream who were there for pleasure are still out there. And there are probably thousands of other Culture 045s out there all over the world. If you're on the deep web, make damn sure you're as careful as possible. Before I start this, I just want to say that I in no way blame this on my friend or her mother at all. The story takes place around two years ago, during the summer of 2019. I was 14 years old at the time and I had a really big group of friends that I would go to the pool with like almost every day. We all lived only a few houses away from each other, except for about three of the girls. There were eight of us. The day was like every other day. We woke up, put on our bathing suits, and we had our friend Ryan's mom take us to the pool. She happened to have a minivan that could fit us all. We got to the pool around 11am and swam until about 9pm when the pool closed. Since all of our parents were super close and we still wanted to keep the fun going, we decided to crash at our friend Ava's house. She had a huge downstairs basement that was soundproof because her dad used to teach guitar and drum lessons to people all the time down there. Two of our friends, Carly and Erin, didn't really want to go because they felt really tired and dizzy for being out all day and night. So we said our goodbyes to the two of them as their parents came and picked them up. And it only took about four minutes for Ava's mom to come get us. She had a smaller car, so we had to squeeze in a little more. When we got to Ava's house, we came inside and thanked her mom for driving us before going to get some snacks from the kitchen. As we walked into the kitchen, we could see Ava's stepdad, David. None of us really liked David since he kind of had a reputation of being really creepy towards us and making rude comments to us whenever our parents came to pick us up. We walked to the cabinets and grabbed all we needed and proceeded to pile down the stairs to the basement. Let me give you a quick layout of the basement. As soon as you walk down the stairs, to your right is sort of a kitchen and work room, and then to your left is a basement living room, and then once you walk past the sofas, there's a pool table. On the left of the pool table, there's a hallway where on the left is a bathroom and storage room, and then to your right is a bedroom. All of us really smelled of sunscreen and chlorine, so we split into groups of two and went to each different room to change out of the bathing suits and into clothes. The basement was kind of creepy, and none of us wanted to be alone in any of the rooms due to the previous paranormal experiences we've had there. Ava always had spare shirts that she'd let us wear that used to be her dad's, and since most of us were five foot two and shorter, the shirts covered us enough that we didn't need to wear shorts. And if you're wondering, yes, we washed our hair. We would usually take turns taking a shower, but we were so tired that we just tilted our heads back over the tub and then took turns washing each other's hair. Once we finished with that, we walked to the basement bedroom and got comfortable. We made bracelets, talked about drama and the new school year coming up, eat junk food, drink Pepsi, and then watched the new season of Stranger Things. After around three hours of this, our friend Ryder was asleep on the bed while the rest of us sat on the floor talking. While Ava was halfway through her sentence, we heard the stairs of the basement then creaking. All of us were silent. Ava said it could just be one of her cats or something, but before she could even finish, we then heard around six more steps from the basement stairs area. Ryan, the oldest of us, seemingly the most freaked out, quietly walked to the door and locked it while me and my friend Molly went to turn off the lights. We waited around five minutes, the only light coming from the computer screen that we'd been watching Netflix on. We quietly whispered about what the noise could be until we heard sliding footsteps coming into the hallway of the basement. Me and Ava grabbed onto each other as everyone else fell silent. After about two minutes of hearing nothing, we all then moved to the bed. While doing this, we managed to wake up Ryder, who then loudly asked, What the hell are y'all doing? Ryan covered his mouth with his hands while telling him what was going on. Ryder, who hates when people wake him up, sat up and told us to calm down, or in his own words, chill the fuck out, as he walked to the basement bedroom door and unlocked it. 
He swung the door open, and what we saw made us all stiff as a board with fear. There in the doorway was Ava's stepdad. Her stepdad was terrifying. He was six foot four, short brownish hair, heavy set, and he had these square glasses that could reflect about anything. Me and everybody else in the room screamed at the top of our lungs as Ryder slammed the door in his face, locked it, and ran into the bed into me and Ryan's arms. We all stayed as silent as possible as we waited for what felt like hours as we heard Ava's stepdad groaning and asking if he could join us. Our friend Izzy and I began to cry while Ava called her mom to come down and get him. After I'd say about 45 minutes, all was silent and we ended up falling asleep piled up on top one another. We woke to the sound of Ava's mom knocking on the door. We then unlocked it and let her in. She then explained to us how after she brought David back up, he then told her, That many young girls down in the dark basement all by themselves is really dangerous. Anything could happen and no one would hear anything. Thank goodness those two boys were in there and were smart enough to lock the door in case anyone tried to do anything. When her mom told us this, I felt sick to my stomach. When I looked over, I saw the look of pure horror and disbelief on everyone's faces. After that, we all decided to go home. I'm 16 years old now, and Ava's stepdad passed away due to the coronavirus. Me and those girls aren't as close anymore, but that night and all the other experiences we've had since then have stayed between us, and they probably always will. This is a disturbing story that happened to me about four years ago. It was around December. The snowstorms were starting to come in, and it was becoming very cold. Me and my wife were trying to get everything we could before winter started, mainly food and supplies. The problem was is that we didn't have a car. We couldn't afford it. I worked a low-wage job and was making enough to barely pay rent on our shitty old apartment. My wife usually stayed home and took care of our two-month-old baby and I was doing the best I could to save enough money for a car. And finally, after months of saving, I had enough. One day I came home and told my wife the good news, and she was relieved. The next day we went to our local car dealership. There was only two cars on the lot, and they weren't the greatest, but the prices were very low, and as long as it got us from point A to point B, we would be happy. So we did what we needed to, paid for it, got the keys, and drove off. The car was from 1984 and was pretty run down, but it drove just fine. Six months later, I was cleaning out the car when I noticed something odd under the back seat. It was something that I had never seen before. Despite having checked the car multiple times at this point, I looked closer, but I would need a flashlight in order to see it clearly. It looks like a black box of some kind. I thought it was just something the previous owner had left behind. Finally, curiosity got the best of me and I pulled it out of the car. It was an old VHS tape, marked Happy Memories. It looked to be around the same age as the car. I didn't know what to do with it. I just thought it was some old home video from the previous owner, although it was pretty strange that it was hiding underneath the seat. While I didn't want to invade anyone's privacy, I decided that I wanted to see what was on the tape to satisfy my curiosity. I went up to my attic and found my old VHS player. I hadn't used it since high school, back when I threw parties and me and my buddies would watch movies on it. It was a bit dusty, but it still worked just fine. I turned it on and put in the tape. It started off pretty normal. It was a family during Christmas, people walking around, opening gifts, etc. Then things got a little uncomfortable. The husband and wife began arguing while the children were crying in the background. The argument got more and more intense as it went on. I could not make out exactly what was being said. The camera cut off and the screen was black before cutting back into a scene that was so fucked up that it kept me up for weeks after. I will never get this image out of my head. The camera was now set up in a dark room. There was torture weapons hanging from the walls and dismembered body parts scattered across the floor. The same wife and children from the beginning were now on their knees chained together and sobbing. That's about as much detail as I'm willing to go into. There was also a man in the room whose face was cut off from the camera's view. The man stepped out of frame and switched off the overhead light. And what he said next won't stop repeating in my head. I guess this is a happy memory for someone like me. 
After that, all that was heard was the horrified screams of the family. I had to turn off the tape. I couldn't take it anymore. I took the tape out and just stared at it for what seemed like hours. The images of the bodies, all the blood, the terrified faces of the family were now burnt into my mind. It was hours before I said a single word to anyone. I eventually called the police and explained what I had found. After weeks of investigation, they found out that this tape was of a family who had gone missing 32 years ago. They said that their house was demolished in 2003, and a car dealership was built in its place, the exact same place where I got the car. That's when it hit me. Thinking back, the car salesman looked a lot like the husband from the beginning of the video, except a lot older. Now that I think about it, he was kind of in a hurry to get us out of there after we bought the car, shortly after the shop was closed down, and is now abandoned. A lot of my friends went there over the years and said it was a really good place for a cheap car. I would pass it every day driving to work. I'm assuming the police followed up on all of this during their investigation, but I never heard of any arrests being made or further updates on the case. As far as I know, that man is still out there. A couple years ago, I found this old VHS tape at my grandparents' house. I know this is kind of cliche, but it was a nondescript tape with no markings on it. It wasn't on the shelf with the other tapes and the few DVDs that my grandparents owned. It was buried in the backyard, inside a metal box. You may be wondering why I found a buried tape in the backyard. That's a fair question. I got a little carried away with my younger brother's metal detector one afternoon. I swear he's such a dork. He bought it online and he was taking the damn thing down the beach almost every other day. When my grandfather passed away, he decided to give it a whirl in their backyard. Moreover, according to my dad, they would bury all sorts of things back there as kids. What I didn't expect to find, though was a metal box containing a VHS tape. It was buried behind the shed, several feet down. I was surprised that the metal detector was able to pick up on something that was buried that deep. I was all alone when I found it, so I didn't exactly go and tell it on the mountain if you know what I mean. Initially, I thought it must have been some kind of fun, cutesy thing my grandparents did. I wouldn't put it past them to bury something in the backyard, then forget all about it. Maybe it was their wedding tape or something. But then I had this sinking feeling. A premonition, really. Whatever it was, it wasn't supposed to be found. Especially by me. I waited until I knew I could have a little time alone. I took one of the old VCRs from my grandparents' house and attached it to a TV in the garage. And then I proceeded to play the tape. It was fuzzy and grainy because, you know, it was a really old tape. But then I started to get a little creeped out. For the first two minutes or so, the camera was just focusing on an old chair in some dimly lit room. I kept straining my eyes, trying to tell what was happening. The video seemed to freeze and then come back into motion. All the while, the chair was there on the foreground, resting against the wall. Then a hooded figure walked into the room, and his right hand was a knife. In his other, he held a young girl by the wrists. She looked like she was a teenager. She was blindfolded and her arms were tied behind her back. A piece of tape was over her mouth. The hooded figure then put her in a chair and then walked out of frame. He kept walking up to her and patting her on the head. And then he would walk out of frame again. I turned up the volume. But all I could hear was muffled sounds. Like the camcorder that was used had a nearly broken microphone. Everything was garbled and incoherent. I started feeling sick like I was watching something disgusting. Every part of my inside started to churn. I could feel the vomit rising inside me. I didn't want to watch another second of the tape, but I just had to know what it was. For the next few minutes, it was just footage of the girl sitting in the chair, her hands bound behind her back. She appeared to be talking or crying. I couldn't be sure because of the quality, and I could barely make out anything as I watched. It was super unsettling. It was just this girl tied to a chair, and some person in a cloak with a knife who was nowhere to be seen. I started to feel like I was watching an actual horror movie. I wanted the girl to get up and run out of the room. 
I wanted someone to storm in and set her free, but I had the sinking feeling that this was not how the movie ended. Unfortunately, I was right. The hooded figure returned. He walked over to the girl and lifted her chin with his free hand. The look in her eyes cracked my soul in two. Then the figure pulled his cloak back. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. It was my grandfather. I turned the tape off and ejected it. I held it in my hands wondering what I should do with it. Destroy it? Turn it into the authorities? I don't know why, but I put the tape back in the metal box and walked around the corner of the tool shed and placed it where I had dug it up. I threw it back into the earth and began piling dirt on it again. All I could think of was trying to bury what I had found, hiding the evidence that was now making me sick. That's when I heard my grandmother's voice behind me. What are you doing? She asked. I looked up at her smiling face, those innocent eyes. She was the sweetest person I knew. I couldn't dare risk her knowing what I had unearthed. The thought of her knowing what was on that tape, knowing that her husband of 50 plus years had this dark, horrible obsession just killed me. So I lied the best I could. Oh, nothing, Grandma. I just thought I found something buried back here, but I was wrong. Her face turned from the normal relaxed smile she usually wore to a cold stare. My heart sank. Grandma took a couple of steps closer to me, her eyes staring deep into mine. Her expression was solemn and serious. That tape was buried for a reason. You weren't supposed to ever see it. She sighed emphatically. But now that you know, I might as well show you everything else. Follow me. My stomach was hot and heavy as I followed my grandmother back inside. She walked slowly, like someone who was trying to stall. We walked in silence past her pristine clean kitchen and into the hallway. I couldn't help but look at the family photos that lined both hallways. Right in the middle was our massive family portrait, next to this ironic picture of my grandparents at their wedding. I always loved looking at this picture growing up. They both looked so young and so happy. Like there was nothing in the world that could defeat their love. Part of me wondered now if that was part of the problem. Grandma kept walking past the bedrooms, to the back of the house where the basement was. Of course she's taking me to the basement, I thought. This was all too stereotypical, too unnerving. She unlocked the basement door and took a deep breath. We stood there in silence for a moment before she spoke. I'm not proud of this. But sometimes you have to deal with the, uh, complications of the person you love. Grandma, please, you don't have to show me anything. Honest. No, you need to know. It's time that you knew the truth. She smiled faintly at me, her eyes moist with tears. We started down the steps. One by one we walked, down the rickety staircase my grandpa always swore was dangerous, which is why we never went into the basement. But also, he kept the damn thing padlocked all the time. My dad would always say it was for safety reasons. We believed him. Why the hell wouldn't we? We stood on the cold cement floor. A bitter draft blew through. I shivered as I waited for Grandma to turn on the lights. When she did, I was surprised. The basement was ordinary in every way imaginable. It was mainly dusty boxes piled in the corners, and a few old knickknacks and relics placed here and there. I heard Grandma take another deep breath. My chest ached at the sound. <sighs> Your grandfather had a problem. It began when he was a young boy, and the war didn't help much either. I don't know why, but I just blurted out, Was he a murderer? My grandma turned. Tears dripped down her cheeks. She forced a smile as she wiped them away. He had a lot of issues. That tape you saw was part of it. He kept that part of him hidden for years, all the while your dad and aunt were growing up. He was the perfect father. I didn't know about any of this, but one day I came down here to look for some Christmas decorations my sister, uh, your great aunt Sally, said that she had loaned me. I never found it, but I did find a small door built into the wall. My grandma showed me in a small alcove was a tiny door built into the wall. It looked like a whimsical feature something that you would find in Alice in Wonderland. It was the exact same color as the stone wall, except it had a dark brass doorknob and a lock. I never knew it existed. So naturally, 
I never tried to open it. I thought maybe it was your grandpa's secret treasure trove room. Boys love to collect and conceal their prizes, so I figured that's what it was. I was able to jimmy the lock open, but what I found... She paused, catching her breath, wiping her eyes again. Well, you know what I found, don't you? I found a tape. But not just one. There were several of them. My grandma opened the tiny door to the wall and showed me what was inside. It was like a miniature blockbuster in there. Shelves lined the walls, enough space to house hundreds of tapes. But it was empty. Completely empty. Here's where I found them. All lined up along the wall. He had magazines too. Dirty, dirty magazines. I couldn't talk to him for weeks, but then I finally confessed what I had found, and we talked through it. None of this made any sense to me. Why the hell would you go on living like everything was completely fine? If you had a psychopath living in the room with you, compiling his awful sex tapes, I didn't understand. At first, he promised to stop. He told me that he made his last tape and that it would never happen again. He told me all the girls in the tapes were misfits and troublemakers. They were lost girls that didn't have homes or morals. He was doing the world a favor, he said, ridding the world of unwanted women who would become pregnant and end up on welfare. And the sad thing is, I believed him. And I guess I agreed too. I stood there trying to find the words, but I was empty. Any notion of my grandparents' character disintegrated in that moment. I was enraged. I felt sick, angry, and betrayed. Like my whole life and the legacy handed to me was a lie. Did my parents know? Did they care? Or were they as nonchalant about it as my grandma? I wanted to scream. I wanted to curse her out because this was twisted, sick shit. How could he? And how could you allow it? My grandma cupped my face in her hands, like she used to do when I was younger. She looked into my eyes. You're a good soul. Some aren't so lucky, sweetie. Your grandpa had his demons. This was all too much. I started to pace back and forth. I didn't know what to say or what to think. None of it made any sense. But why didn't you turn him in? Why did you let him have this sick obsession? I tried to fight him on it at first. But something changed in me, I guess. I looked at her still confused, still in shock. What are you saying? Where are the rest of the tapes? My grandma smiled slightly at me, her dark brown eyes dry from tears. They locked into mine. I stared into them, and they were empty and void. After I couldn't get your grandpa to stop, I accepted my fate. All I could do was... Help him. What? You helped him? I would hold the camera. My heart was beating hard and fast. It was too much. Way too much. Where are the tapes? After your grandfather passed, I buried them. One by one in the backyard. I couldn't bear the thought of destroying our work. But I knew that no one could ever see them. She paused and looked at me. Unless, of course, you want to watch them. My grandma moved around the corner of the alcove, past the small door where the tapes had been concealed. She held up a suit bag and placed the bag on a hook on the wall. She unzipped the bag and held out its contents. It was a black robe with a hood. She smiled sadistically at me as she held it in her hands. He would want you to have this, she said. When I was around 16 or 17, I used to house slash dog sit for a family that I'd known ever since I was much younger. The family consisted of a couple, their three-year-old kid, and their two German Shepherd dogs. They would go on vacation twice every year, and each time would ask me to watch both the dogs and the house itself. The house they owned was actually really nice. It was huge, so much so that it seemed like every time I would house sit for them, I would find another section of the house I had never even known existed. It was tucked far back away from residential roads, and had a really long driveway leading up to the house itself. This would of course give the house a sense of isolation, while still being in a nice neighborhood. It was December, and I was once again asked to watch the house. 
I didn't mind, as my school was on break at the time, and it actually allowed me to make use of the extra time by earning a little extra cash. Everything began as usual. I got the mail, fed the dogs, and played with them for a little bit while watching movies in the house's living room. Now, something to note is the house itself was over an hour away from my own, which made it almost pointless not to just stay there. I would have to go there at least twice a day anyway, so I didn't think it made much sense to drive back and forth from my house to this one. The family didn't mind, and plus, they would say I could eat whatever I could find in the house. Anyway, after a couple movies, I got tired and went to one of the guest bedrooms to go to sleep. The dogs would of course follow me, as they would usually tend to sleep in whatever room I did. After browsing on my phone in bed for a couple minutes, I finally turned over and started actually trying to sleep. I've never been the best at falling asleep. It wasn't uncommon for me to take upwards of an hour, especially in a somewhat unfamiliar environment. I was laying there for around 30 minutes, in complete darkness and silence, when, out of nowhere, I could hear the collars jingle as both of the dogs' heads shot up simultaneously. Instantly, I was put into a state of total awareness, as they could obviously hear something that I couldn't. It was possible the noise was just a friend of the family stopping by, as that has happened in the past. But they would always shoot me a text, or call me beforehand. And plus, at that point it was already midnight. And then, again, the dog's heads shot up. But this time I could hear the sound too. It was a constant fuzzing sound, kind of like the sound you'd hear of an old TV on an empty channel. The sound got louder, and I literally sat up trying to figure out both what it was and where it was coming from. I got up and turned on the lights of the room, and that's when I realized the noise was coming from a baby monitor. A baby monitor in which the camera was in a completely different room on the other side of the house. I looked at the screen and could see the words noise detected, but everything else on the screen was dark. I picked up the monitor and started going through the controls to go through the settings to figure out what was going on. And that's when I came across the setting labeled Room Light with an on-off switch right next to it. I figured to put my mind at ease, I had no choice but to turn the room light on from the monitor and verify that nothing was there. So I did. I set the room light to on, closed out of the settings screen, and was greeted to a screen showing the same room now filled with light. And that's when I saw it. Crouched down in the corner of the room, behind a crib, was what looked like to be a man in a dark hoodie. I squinted at the screen, desperately trying to prove to myself that what I was seeing wasn't actually a person. But when in reaction to the light, the figure got up and sprinted out of the room, is when the reality of the situation truly started to set in. I was not alone in that house. Realizing this guy could find where I was, I locked myself in the room I was staying in. All the while, the dogs were now barking like crazy. Thinking quick, I would grab my stuff, open the window to the bedroom, and full on sprint towards my car. Once I got inside, I would immediately lock the doors and speed out of the driveway. As I was leaving, I caught multiple glances of the house, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. I was absolutely horrified and would frantically call the family multiple times on my drive home, but most likely due to the time of night, they wouldn't answer. So I decided once I got home, I would leave them a text explaining everything that had happened. The family was scheduled to come back the next afternoon anyway, so I figured it wasn't my problem to worry about anymore. Later the next day, I would receive a text back from the family showing me compassion for what I had experienced, but ultimately they would say how when they arrived back to the house, absolutely nothing was out of the ordinary, other than the dog still being locked in the guest room. If I'm being honest, I don't think they believe me whatsoever, but I know what I saw that night. I've never felt such a deep, electric sense of imminent danger like I did when looking at that baby monitor screen. When the family asked me back a few months later, though I really could have used the money, I would politely decline the offer. I'm 21, and was recently asked by my uncle if I could watch his dog while he was out of town. My uncle lives in a remote town in Alaska, and has a Siberian husky named Duke. Almost right away, I would send a text back to him saying, yeah, of course, man. Now, I've never watched his dog before, but I knew for a fact Duke was well-trained, and basically all I would have to do is feed him and take him outside every once in a while. Plus, he lives in a cabin in the middle of the woods that, like I mentioned earlier, is really remote. I'm talking neighbors miles away kind of remote. So, with how busy and stressful my job has been lately, I was actually really looking forward to it. 
I decided it was the perfect idea to invite my girlfriend over to stay with me as I watched Duke. Cause, I mean, it wasn't like I was just gonna show up twice a day or anything. I figured I'd just stay at the house the whole time. The first few days were completely normal. Well, I guess other than it snowing pretty much the entire time we were there, which, all things considered, actually wasn't too unheard of for Alaska. It was now the last night before my uncle would get back into town, and me and my girlfriend had the fireplace going while we were watching a movie with Duke in the cabin's living room. After the movie ended, I'd say it was around 1am, and we both decided we should probably head to bed. As we were walking to the bedroom, I couldn't help but notice how much the wind and snowfall had picked up outside. But regardless, we were both tired and still each fell asleep within 5 minutes of laying down. I'm a heavy sleeper and was completely out of it for a good 2 hours when I was shaken awake by my girlfriend. The digital clock in the room read 3.20am and it was still pitch black outside. Now realizing I was awake, my girlfriend firmly said how she thought she heard something outside and that I should probably go take a look. Still half asleep at this point, I replied saying, Yeah, yeah sure I'll go look. As I got up, I caught a glimpse of Duke, who should have been sleeping at this time, but instead was cowering in the closet with his eyes wide open. Even though he's a big dog, he doesn't usually like to investigate or confront any noise he hears. So, I mean the fact that he was awake in the first place made me a little uneasy. I put on some winter clothes and grabbed a hunting rifle and a flashlight before heading out. I stepped outside and turned on my flashlight, but right as I did, I could see boot prints in the snow. My heart sank to the pit of my stomach right as I saw them. I knew they weren't mine. It was impossible. I had literally just stepped outside. After standing there in utter disbelief for maybe a minute, I decided I should probably go follow them. I mean, you gotta remember, we're in the middle of a desolate, snowy forest, and obviously no normal person is gonna walk by this cabin at 3 in the morning. I figured my uncle would want me to find out who it was. And plus, if it was somebody with bad intentions, I'm a 6'5 dude armed with a rifle. What's the worst that could happen? And so I did. I followed the footsteps. I quickly realized that they had straight up come out of the forest, did a circle around the cabin, and went back in the same direction they had come from. I'd say it was maybe three minutes of following the footsteps into the forest, when, horrifyingly, a black smudge was revealed in the distance by my flashlight. I stopped in my tracks, trying to discern what I was actually looking at. It was a man. Like, an actual person just standing there and holding a very large black bag over his shoulder. He had his back to me, so I couldn't see his face. The dude literally had no reaction to me pointing my flashlight at him. I tried to bring myself to yell out to him, but I couldn't do it. I mean, the whole situation was straight out of a nightmare. Adrenaline building up, I did the only thing I could. Turn around and sprint back to the cabin. The whole while, I swear, I could hear footsteps behind me, but I didn't look back. When I got to the cabin, I ran inside and slammed the door shut. My girlfriend gave me a look of both fear and confusion. I firmly told her to pack her stuff because we needed to leave. Without even asking why, she complied. I also packed my stuff, and we were ready in no more than three minutes. We grabbed Duke, opened the front door, and sprinted towards the car. Once we got inside and turned on the car, to my complete horror, the headlights revealed the same man in the tree line. My girlfriend saw too, and needless to say, we got out of there as quick as we could. On our way back into civilization, I would explain everything to my girlfriend. We would also call my uncle, who surprisingly answered. After explaining what we had encountered, he replied saying, Yeah, that's really creepy dude. I'll check it out tomorrow once I get back. My uncle would later claim that once he arrived back home, there were footsteps practically everywhere, as if the guy had just been pacing around the whole yard. But the guy himself was nowhere to be seen, and was never seen again. To this day, I have no idea who we really saw that night, or what was in the abnormally large bag he was carrying around. I didn't even see the guy's face, so obviously there's not really much we could report to the police. Neither me or my girlfriend have house or dog sat ever since, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. When I was in middle school, my mom worked as a house cleaner, which, as the name implies, simply meant people would hire her to clean their houses for an actual decent amount of money. More often than not, the houses were both big and expensive, and a lot of the time, my mom would become good friends with the owners of the houses she cleaned. 
one of the homes was owned by an older couple who had no kids but had a huge house and a really nice pool that they always invited me and my siblings to come swim in. It basically became a routine. Every time my mom was asked to clean the house, us kids would ride along so we could go swimming. I remember one day, the owners were talking about a vacation they were planning on going on and suggested one of us kids could stay at the house and watch their dogs while they were gone. And instantly, both me and my sister both volunteered without hesitation. The couple had an older golden retriever named Bandit, who was massive, but wasn't aggressive in any way. They also had recently rescued a husky mix named Cleo, who was quite the opposite. She would destroy their house when they left her inside, jump their short fence if they left her outside, and run away at any chance she got. So they would basically have me stay at their house for the weekend and keep the two dogs under control. My older sister would stay with me the first night, as it was a big house, and even with the dogs, it was kind of scary to stay there alone. It was maybe 10pm, I was watching some movie in the basement living room while my sister was working out on the treadmill in the next room over. Now, something that needs to be mentioned is that the house itself had multiple cameras set up on both the inside and the outside. And the workout room also doubled as a sort of camera room, where a screen featured a live feed of all the cameras. All of the sudden, I could hear the house alarm beep like it did whenever the front door was opened. At first I ignored it, as I thought it came from the TV. But minutes later, my sister would walk out of the workout room asking if I had left the front door open, as the cameras clearly showed it wide open. And that's when I started to panic, realizing that I had forgotten to lock the front door in the first place. I would frantically explain to my sister both the alarm I heard and how I would forgotten to lock the front door. But she called me down, saying that if someone was in the house, the dogs would have been going crazy. The dogs were just laying there in the workout room, and we both agreed they would have at least gotten up to investigate if someone had come inside. We both closed and locked the door, and decided that at this point we should probably just go to bed. But before we did, we went around the house and made sure all the doors and windows were completely locked. We then locked ourselves in the guest bedroom with the dogs, and eventually fell asleep. A couple hours later, we both awoke to both dogs growling at the door of the room. Now, it was fairly normal for Cleo to bark and growl for no reason, but Bandit had never barked or shown any signs of aggressiveness at all, so immediately we knew something was wrong. We tried to think of any logical explanation as to what could have made them so aggressive. We guessed they could have heard an animal outside, but that hope was quickly shot down when again the dreadful sound of the door alarm beeping rang throughout the house this time followed by a pair of footsteps upstairs. At that point, we both started crying in sheer terror. My sister frantically called our dad, who told us to hang up and call the police immediately while he made his way over. He would make the 15 minute drive in under 5 minutes, and as soon as he got there, we would open the bedroom door to meet him. And right as we did, the dogs took off running and barking all throughout the house. My dad took a quick look around the upstairs levels with his gun, but didn't see anything unusual. The police arrived a few minutes later, and after looking around, they confirmed that it seemed someone had been inside, but that whoever it was hadn't stolen or disturbed anything. My dad made us wait in the car while he and the police reviewed what the cameras had actually caught that night. After maybe 30 minutes, he came back, and I could tell his face was pale white. When I asked him what the cameras had captured, he wouldn't tell us anything. My mom never cleaned that house again, and both my parents told us we weren't allowed to go there anymore. To this day, I have no idea what those cameras caught that night, or what really went down. But honestly, based on my dad's reaction, a part of me doesn't ever want to know.